Welcome to the Brady Marks podcast with your host, Brady Yashia from Brady Marks Buyers Advisory. Enjoy discussions with a variety of guests and pioneers from diverse backgrounds, each sharing their unique perspectives on property, business, industry, and more. Sydney real estate auctioneer, Emma Brown Garrett, is one of Australia's most promising talents in the auctioneering space. After a real estate career spanning 20 years, primarily in real estate sales, Emma's transition into auctioneering was a natural progression. She has worked in property management, project marketing and sales and excelled at all of them. But it wasn't until she discovered the power of a great auction campaign that she fell in love with auctioneering. Her vibrant and engaging personality draws people in and creates genuine confidence and trust in her skill set. With an interesting and colourful life, including an acting career in Bollywood, she shares her story of finding her niche and passion later in life. She discusses the important lessons of believing in yourself, backing your ambition and having the patience to know if you work hard, train hard and surround yourself with the right people, your time will come. Welcome, Emma. It's fabulous to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. You're what welcome. an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you truly are inspirational. And your journey is fascinating, going from an actress to an auctioneer. It's a long journey. It's been <laughs> happening for a very long time. I actually started acting when I was about 12 years old. So I started that as a young girl and um, and obviously got to continue it in different parts of my life throughout. So it's been a journey. I'm sure it's been an exciting journey and lots of lessons learned along the way. Yes. Can you take us a little bit back in time, maybe to when you first started your career and how it progressed from being an actress to an auctioneer? Absolutely. So as I said, I started acting very young and I also started working in real estate very young. I worked for a little business on the North Shore answering the phones on Saturday mornings when the boys were out calling um, auctions or open for inspections. And I was quite young. I think I was probably around 14 or 15 at that time. And I always loved the environment. And so I'm not surprised that I've ended back up in real estate for my entire career because I felt like I really connected with it back then. Um, I spent some time in my teenage years and in my 20s becoming an actress and commercials and bits and pieces in Home and Away and little things like that. But I always was drawn to real estate. And I think when I started working in property in my early 20s, I just knew that it was going to be something that I could have longevity with. And I loved working in the space. So I I had my time as an actress, as a young girl, but, um, you know, transitioning into real estate was definitely like, what's what's your backup plan? What's the career (laughs) choice? You know, sometimes it doesn't always happen as an actress. So real estate was a great option for me. And a natural progression. Absolutely. Yeah. So so what was it like being in Bollywood? I mean, that sounds so exciting. I had been in real estate for quite a long time when my husband had an incredible opportunity for us to live and work in Mumbai. And I'll never forget him coming home and asking me if it's something that we should do. Uh, He's a banker and there was an opportunity for him to start a financial wealth business in Mumbai. And he said, look, if I take this position, what will you do? And I'd been working in real estate for quite some time. I was developing a great sales career. I was working with Damien Bickmore Hutt as his PA and was about to jump into this incredible career when this opportunity came up. And I said to my husband, well, I could possibly do some, some you know, relocation or some property in India, but I think I might get back into acting. And I remember him just looking at me thinking, what? What do you mean you just get back into acting? <laughs> so uh, I quit my sales career here in Sydney and I landed in Mumbai and I had my first job within two weeks of landing there. So it was a pretty incredible experience. We were there for five years. I made some huge Bollywood films. I was very famous there, but nobody knew when I came back home. (laughs) It was a little bit of a shock when I returned to Sydney. Um, But we had a great time there. It was incredible. My husband built this amazing business. I studied Hindi. I had my first baby in Mumbai. Um, It was a really great little chapter of my life and I'll always hold it very close to my heart. Um, But I still got drawn back into real estate. It was always there waiting for me when I came home, which is really cool. It must have been a very transformative experience for you and for the family. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any moments that you want to share with us besides the few that you've just mentioned now yes. that you feel really has made you who you are today? Is there one moment or an experience? 
Actually, talking about living abroad uh, was a very big thing for my husband and I. And I truly believe when you put yourself in a situation like that where it's kind of sink or swim, and I always felt like it was kind of us against the world. And I learned a lot about myself living abroad. It wasn't the first time I lived abroad. Um, I had been a flight attendant in my <laughs> early 20s. Oh, that's something new yeah, we're learning so about I, you. <laughs> I, I lived, I lived um, in Bahrain actually and worked um, with Gulf Air for a few years. So I'd lived abroad before and I'd had these experiences and something about living abroad and working really hard and you have to make it, you push yourself out of your boundaries. And I definitely think for me, living and working abroad like that, I was quite determined to make it. I think that's just who I am. I'm quite determined and ambitious anyway, but pushing yourself out of your limits when you're living overseas is a big thing. So I learned that lesson. Absolutely. It's a great lesson. Yeah. I always say you've got to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. I was very uncomfortable moments (laughs) in moments in Mumbai. Absolutely. (laughs) Not just the language, but I mean, I had to study, I had to study the language there just in order for me to communicate. I mean, I don't stop talking. So I wasn't going to spend five years living in a country where I didn't speak the language. So to learn a language at 30 was, that was another thing too, to read and write and speak fluent Hindi by the time I was about 34. That was amazing. Oh, that's Yeah, a, it was amazing very actually. Very impressive. It's not that great now. <laughs> Sometimes if I have a couple of glasses of wine, a little bit comes out, but obviously, you know, it was a real, it was a real achievement for me. Yes. Mm. So in terms of learning new skill sets, because we haven't even touched on anything personal yet, but Did you learn how to cook Indian food? I did learn how to cook (laughs) Indian food. I make the most delicious dal. It's amazing. But, uh, you know, I think just more than anything, the experience of living overseas in, in a different country, a third world country, and, you know, succeeding as an actress, which I tried to do here for a very long time. Um, it was just a very different and almost bizarre experience. When we look back now, my husband and I can't believe that we did it actually. Mm. Well, I'm sure they're memories forever. Forever, yep. And I have another question for you. What is something that only those people close to you know about yourself? You're going to love this. (laughs) I have an enormous cowboy boot collection. Oh, my goodness. I do, yes. (laughs) I have been collecting cowboy boots for 20 years. I have a, a range that from 1960s right up until now. And every time we travel, I often buy myself a pair of cowboy boots, whether we're in the States or wherever we are. And my husband just, he just can't handle it. He says, baby, you really don't need another pair of cowboy boots, but it's a collection. It's something that I've owned. I still wear them. Um, I used to wear them a lot when I was younger. I sold cowboy boots for a long time. Um, I worked at Route 66 in retail and I sold cowboy boots and I had a huge collection when I was there. But yes, I collect cowboy boots. And believe me, they're not easy to store. I mean, there's a lot of space that's required. Yes, absolutely. So when when we renovated, I had built a space and and my, my cowboy boots are now living in this lovely built-in wardrobe and yes so only those close to me know that I love cowboys <laughs> not to be seen on auction day oh, okay there's, there's no don't worry they're not coming out anytime soon but definitely something that I just absolutely love cowboy boots just the best look ever oh so well we've now learned a couple of things about you today <laughs> I like that it's good it's a good thing to collect expensive expensive hobby so you you talk about surrounding yourself with the right people and having a plan yes. Are there any mentors or people that have been part of your world that are standouts? And is there anything in particular that has helped you become who you are today? This is a really good question. So as you mentioned, it's been a long time for me in real estate and uh, I have worked with some of the most incredible men and women in real estate. When I look back at my career and have had the opportunity to share the space and the platform with so many different incredible men and women, for a very long time, I I was looking for a mentor. I I was searching for a mentor. I wanted a mentor to be someone that was like me, um, a fabulous woman who was outgoing and and had great shoes. And you know, I really I had this particular idea of what I wanted and what I thought I needed in a mentor. One of the things that you learn as you get older is that your mentor actually finds you. And so I have had the opportunity to join Menk White um, some years ago now, about three or four years, and obviously working with Clarence White and the team there, Clarence being a mentor for me has just been incredible and opened up an entire um, opportunity for me in the auctioneering space. But it's it's funny that I end up, you know, having a... 
a, a male as a mentor who I who I didn't even expect would be the right person for me, and he's really lifted me to those heights. So definitely, Clarence White and and Paul Mank and the whole team at Mank White has been a, a huge has had a huge impact on my career, which has been great. And I can understand that. I mean, Clarence is an inspiration himself. Yes, and very, very successful. Much. So that's interesting because we all have particular ideas in our yes. minds of who or what we want to gravitate to, but sometimes what we really need is very different to what our mind is saying we want. Yes, so, so true. <laughs> and I think also you you spend a lot of time in real estate working in different sectors, whether it's leasing or project marketing or sales. And, you know, you do have to find your people and find your crew. And I talk about this a lot. I found my crew at 42. You know, this is, it. I didn't find it in my 20s. I, I worked with some amazing people, but it just you know, my morals and my values and, you know, my ethos of towards business, when you find those people that want to do exactly the same thing that you do and they push you in the right direction, it's pretty impressive, you know, to, and it took me to my 40s to find yeah. them. It is impressive. And I think the important thing there to, to understand for the listeners out there is that it's okay to make mistakes along the way and it's okay to not feel quite right. But when you are in the right space, like you say, in your 40s, it's going to flow Absolutely. and you're going to excel and you're going to be passionate, even more passionate than when you were when you started. So there's a lot of life lessons in our talk today. I think that the listeners will be able to take a lot away from this. Um, one of the things I know about you is that your energy is incredible <laughs> and contagious, especially during auctions. How do you keep your energy levels so high? <laughs> Everyone always talks about my high energy. My daughter calls me high functioning, which I really love. <laughs> I don't do coffee, which is uh, which wow. is another thing that nobody knows about me. I'm a huge tea drinker. Um, I don't use caffeine, so I think my natural energy is there. But I also think my energy has been there along the way throughout my career. But since I've stepped into my 40s and I've stepped into my power, I, I talk a lot about this as women stepping into their power and and owning their their career and their moment and their life. Since I have stepped into my power in these last couple of years and become an auctioneer, as I've always wanted to become, my energy definitely has increased because I love what I do. And I'm very passionate about calling auctions. And so I think I'm probably the happiest auctioneer in Sydney, <laughs> if not Australia. <laughs> so you're not taking Baraka in the morning? There's no, <laughs> there's no supplements. There's no caffeine. It's just all natural, all me. <laughs> so what strategies do you have to keep yourself motivated? I'm pretty ambitious, as I said before. Um, I, as a female in this space, and you've talked about this before um, with Clarence mm. when, when he was on your podcast, that... There's not a, a large number of female auctioneers. Um, I, I quite enjoy uh, paving the way and being a little bit of inspiration to some of the younger women out there that think, oh, I, I, I think I could do that because that was me. And when I approached my, you know, bosses or mentors or colleagues and said, you know what, I think I can do that, often it was not encouraged. And so I feel me putting myself in this space and shining and becoming a better auctioneer every day, I'm hoping that that inspires people. So I, that's one of my things that, that kind of gets me motivated and pushes me forward is that I want to be the best at this and I hope that there's women around that think I could also do that. Well, you certainly shine through. Are you seeing more females wanting to come into that space? Absolutely. Uh, we, we saw each other at WIRE a few yes. weeks ago, yeah. months ago now. God, I don't even remember it what was it was. Yeah. In March. In March. We're now in May, end of May. Exactly. <laughs> um, I had a lot, so many women come up to me afterwards uh, after I spoke at the event saying, you know, I would have loved to become an auctioneer. And I think that is something that's quite powerful where they thought that they'd like to do it, but they didn't have the space to kind of grow in it. And yeah. so, um, yeah, definitely... I, I want to see more women stepping up saying, I think I could be really good at that. Uh, it's just a matter of, of you know, time and, and um, you know, hopefully people around them encouraging them and training them and pushing them in the right direction and having a great mentor. Yes. Yeah, having That's a great very mentor. Important. Yeah. Yes. So as we talk about the industry coming with hurdles and particularly being a female, whether you're a selling agent or you're an auctioneer, there are lots of hurdles are there any times or is there a time that you feel that there was a particular hurdle that you needed to overcome or a couple of hurdles? And 
if so, how did you overcome the hurdle or hurdles? I actually uh, almost didn't continue with becoming an auctioneer. I had a lot of no's. I had decided that I wanted to quit sales and I wanted to become an auctioneer. And I really pushed and tried. I met with a lot of people. Uh, I, I just couldn't seem to find, nobody wanted to take me on. What I said before about it's very hard to get auctions when you haven't called any auctions. Yeah. A lot of people just didn't didn't want to have me in their business. And it wasn't a personal thing. I didn't ever take it as a personal thing. But it's very hard to try and become an auctioneer when you don't have the experience. And nobody really wants to take you under their wing. It wasn't until I met Clarence and the team at Mank White and Clarence saw something in me and he thought, I'm, I'm really going to give you a shot. And he did give me a shot. There was a lot of other people there that didn't give me an opportunity. And I actually decided that I didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, I'd met with Clarence and, and I'd said to him, Clarence, I, I, I don't see what the point is. I've been trying and trying and trying and nobody seems to want to give me a go. Maybe it's not the right space for me. Maybe it's just, maybe the industry is not ready for a strong woman to stand up and say, I want to do this. I really felt like it wasn't. I had actually gone ahead and built a website. I was building a public speaking website for women. I was going to work in that space. And uh, Clarence said to me, I don't think you should, I don't think you should give up. I think you should do it. I really think you should do it. And I said, okay. And that's when he said, you have to work twice as hard. You're going to have to really push yourself. But he said, I don't think you should do it. I think you've got something special and, and you should give it a shot. And so I went ahead and did it. But there was a time there where I thought it wasn't even giving up on myself, but what, what's the point? If you're banging your head up against a brick wall all the time and nobody's going to give you a shot, you need someone to believe in you. You need someone to say, come with me, let's do it together, let me show you the way. And so every the whole team at Mank White, Clarence, Paul, it's it's been amazing. So, yeah. They've been a, a huge support. Absolutely. And I have to say that you're the one that's certainly shone through. Mm, you just have to keep going. It's that's a stayers it. game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> so how do you prepare for game day? So this is a good question because I don't think people realise as an auctioneer, people think we don't work that much. We work a couple of nights a week and then we work on Saturdays. Uh, we train every single week. So the team and I have a meeting and we train on Tuesdays for a couple of hours, which is great, sometimes three hours. We're always training. Uh, we do some competitions as well. There's a competition space out there that's available for auctioneers to compete against each other. We do mock auctions. Um, it's it's quite fun in that space of kind of competing and, and becoming a better auctioneer. But definitely preparation uh, for just general Saturdays. Uh, we, we train each week. We talk about different um, uh, situations that could happen on auction day. And we are also very compliant too. So a large part of our business is based around being very compliant. And when we show up for our clients, we have every piece of paperwork. We have everything that you would need to put yourself in that in that right position to be compliant. So I'm really strict on that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. No one needs Office of Fair yeah. Trading knocking on the doors, you know. So yeah. I like my compliance. So preparation is the key. Absolutely, yeah. So when we talk about preparing, I know voice projection yes. and body language is very important. For somebody that's in business that wants to improve their voice and their their body language, do you have any tips for Yes, them? I do. I spent a long time uh, focusing on my body language as an auctioneer. Uh, we tend to move a lot um, and when you're in that space, it's quite nice to be still and be focused and I think – the more conscious you are of your body language in that very moment, whether you're public speaking, whether you're presenting to your team, whether you're auctioneering, keeping yourself centred and grounded and, and still in that moment is quite powerful. Um, also, when it comes to voice projection, uh, you, you, you have to choose your moment where your tone, in what tone you use. Often we auction in small apartments. You need to bring that right back down or we auction when buyers want to stand across the street and they don't want to come <laughs> forward to the auctioneers. So you do have to learn to use your voice in different ways. But a big thing for me moving into this space was to really focus on my body language and and hold myself in the right way, my hand movements and definitely, um, you know, and, and again, coming in your power and, and having a great presence. 
Mm. Yeah, it's very important. Absolutely. And I think that once you've got all that right, the confidence is there. Yeah, absolutely. Because your voice is coming across well, your your body, people, eyes are on you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're on show. You're on, you're on show. Yeah, <laughs> so. You're absolutely on show. In that very moment, 15 minutes, you are the centre of attention, you're controlling the situation and I think you have to step out there and you you have to be confident from the second you're there. That's that's an absolute key. Yes. So what was your first auction like? Oh my god, my first auction. One of my so one of my first auctions that I did was actually in the novice auctioneers competition for the REI New South Wales and I actually won the heat to go into the final. And I remember doing the auction and it was just a mock auction, but I remember doing the auction and in that entire moment and that space that I was in that arena doing it, I just knew that I was doing the right thing. And then, of course, my name got called and I won and I moved through to the final. In that very, very moment, I knew that this is exactly what I should be doing for the rest of my life. Of course, moving into the Saturday space and calling my first auction in front of not my peers and not my friends and family. I talk about um, I don't I don't suffer from nerves. Uh, I talk about it being energy. So I don't like the word nerves. I don't like people when they say they're nervous. You can't be nervous when you're prepared, when you're organised and you're ready. So I talk about this energy, and I just I ha- I stepped out into that space and I had this calm this kind of calm feeling come over me, instead of being anxious and worked up and and energy flowing through and, oh, my God, I'm going to mess this up. I don't know what I'm doing. I just felt like I was exactly where I should be. So most people would think in that very moment that you'd be freaking out, but I was so prepared and I wanted it so badly that I, I, I knew that it was it was time and I was just ready. Is that odd? No, no not at all. <laughs> I think it's a good lesson for the listeners. Yeah. So you, preparation you, makes perfection. Cannot, we, I talk about this all the time with public speaking that, it's not nerves. You're only nervous when you show up and you haven't done any work and you don't know what you're doing. If you step out into a space where you are prepared, organised and you know exactly what you're going to say and you know how to deliver it, you just have to take that energy and just let it flow and come out of you and your presentation and whatever you're doing will be perfect. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I love public speaking. I'm, I actually love to even train public speaking. Like it's just an amazing thing and a lot of people don't get taught how to do it properly. So yeah. Yeah, we might get you to come and teach the team. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking. <laughs> Body language. <laughs> um, so do you have any funny moments or awkward moments when calling an auction <laughs> that you want to share with the listeners? I actually I actually had one not that long ago with a client who I've been working with and we have a fantastic relationship together. He's very funny and very dry. And we had this fabulous apartment in Darlinghurst and it was taking a little bit longer for negotiations to take place. But in the current climate and marketplace that we're in, we often see the auction just hold. We might go back and forth and negotiate with the vendor and the buyer. And we like to keep the auction open so we can sell it under the hammer. There's no need to pass a property in if two parties are there and they're willing to negotiate. It was taking quite some time and a few people started to leave and just put their paddles down on the table. And I made a little joke about please lock the doors. <laughs> and I, I think it, I think in my in my tone and my and my delivery was a little dry and I think a few people actually freaked out. <laughs> lock the doors, no one's leaving, please stop leaving. We're gonna sign these contracts today. So but there's often funny moments in auctions where people might say something silly or do something funny. And and in that moment as the auctioneer, it's your opportunity to control that and You know, maybe if there's somebody who's being disruptive, try and make a little bit lighter or distract the situation. So, yeah, there's so (laughs) many scenarios. We could be here for the rest of the day talking about auction scenarios. I'm sure. So talking a little bit about um, career change, most people aren't in their original career that they started in. I mean, I'm not. I've certainly moved. Me neither. (laughs) From where I started to where I am now, but everything progressed very naturally. And yes, at times I felt uncomfortable and it was very daunting. But for somebody that is looking to change or switch their career, what would your advice be to them? This is a good question. I talk a lot about the real estate sector and your time in real estate that you can move around. One of the best things about our industry is that 
So I can sit here and say to you that I've worked in real estate for 20 plus years, but I've had different jobs and different roles. And that's such a lovely space to work in that if you try property management, it's not for you. Jump into marketing and see how that goes. Jump into sales and try it. But you can still stay in that same sector. I think you should never be afraid to change your career no matter what age you are. I literally decided to become an auctioneer in when I turned 40. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable to think that you just move away from everything you've known and jump into a space where I had no experience whatsoever. I mean, that's not easy. No. It's not easy. And remember, you can't no one's booking you for an auction unless you've called an auction and you can't call an auction <laughs> without someone booking you. So it's a very uncomfortable space there where you just don't know what you're doing for a small time. But every time you move into a new role, you don't know what you're doing. You learn. And as the weeks go by, you grow, you perfect the role and eventually become the professional. So you you have to you have to take a leap of faith. And you, if and if you need to change, you have to change because otherwise you just become stagnant and you don't want to be in the yeah. role anymore. So, yeah, I think take a little bit of leap of faith and just back yourself. Yes, yeah. I, I absolutely agree that, especially being a female in this industry and being in the auctioneer, auctioneering world where it is male dominated, I take my hat off to you. Thank firstly. you. Thank but yes, you. you've got to take a leap of faith. You've got to have a thick skin mm-hmm. and be very persistent. Mm-hmm. So networking in the real estate arena is a very big part of the career path for all people. doesn't matter whether you're a selling agent or a buyer's agent or even an auctioneer. And some people absolutely love networking and others don't. I I love networking. (laughs) I know. (laughs) (laughs) I love networking. Um, So uh, then I would, and then, then the answer to my question would be, is that how, and how do you keep your networking, um, how do you keep meeting new people to try and increase your um, level of expertise within your field and also to get more clients? Great question. Um, Also, I like to train and um, meet other auctioneers as well. I think when we talked before about that competition space, the opportunity to go and see a lot lot of different auctioneers compete and perform putting yourself in that space where you're growing as an auctioneer. I absolutely love to go to events. I'm a huge believer of showing up to an event every couple of months, meeting new people. You do not know who you sit next to. I have ended up in different positions and different careers and different jobs because I've sat next to people at an event. Um, I always joke with the guys in the team that every time I get a new handbag, I fill it with business cards. <laughs> so in my handbag drawer, every single one of my handbags has a handful of men quite business cards. You <laughs> never leave the house without a business card. That's just non-negotiable. Um, but I do think attending events, um, especially especially female events, I'm a huge believer in going and speaking and, and being part of, of female events, especially in the real estate sector. Yes. And remember... Um, I have a sales background, so hitting the phones for me and, you know, networking and prospecting on the phones comes quite naturally for me. And so my clients are the agents. And so picking up the phone, calling a new agent, introducing yourself, going for a coffee, it's just a natural progression of, of making those relationships. It's just about relationships. Nothing has to happen on the first date. You know, you don't you don't <laughs> yes. have to sign a deal in that first meeting. Yeah. But just building that relationship and it's just it's sales 101, right? It's just keeping those relationships going and having them in your pipeline. It's sticking to the basics. Sticking to the basics. Yeah. Yep. So you're a very successful businesswoman. Thank you. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure after today's conversation, once the listeners have listened to every th- our conversation, they're going to be inspired. We may see a few more female auctioneers. I hope so. <laughs> How do you define success? This is this is a great question. All your questions are great. <laughs> I struggled for quite some time with defining success. I have got two beautiful children. I've got a 13-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl. I thought that I would feel an enormous amount of success from becoming a mother. I thought I would feel an enormous amount of success of becoming an actress. It's not really until I've got into my 40s and I've started to become a professional at my chosen career as a real estate agent but also becoming an auctioneer that I'm starting to feel like 
maybe everything I've done is one big success. I thought every individual thing that I was doing would tick that box and I would feel successful. But now I'm starting to realise that all of my life's achievements is what's really defining success for me. Um, everyone, everyone's successes, their, their goals and their and their achievements are very different. But I, it's been a, it's been a tough one for me. It's a very grey area for me. I definitely feel now as a successful auctioneer that I've starting to get to that point where I do feel success as a businesswoman. But it's everything together. It's my marriage. It's my children. It's my relationship with my family. My relationship with my colleagues at work. Um, and everyone that I work with in general on my clients, that's making me feel very successful. So, yeah, it's that's a, that's a tough question for me because, <laughs> you know, as a woman, as a mother, you're expected to feel like, you know, I've had these children and now I'm a huge success or I've I've, I've ticked that box in my career and now I'm a huge success. But I don't think that happens to everybody. No, and I think you've hit the nail on the mm. head there that all the achievements are a success. Yeah. So it's a combination of different life experiences Absolutely. Um, I love that. Because uh, it's not easy. You, we do go through life. I will share a quick story with you. When I was younger in my 20s, uh, my mid-20s, my late 20s, I had a lot of girlfriends of mine who were in fashion who had an enormous amount of success in their late 20s. I spent years of my life not understanding why I couldn't have that. Why I, I used to say to my husband, my boyfriend then, why is it not happening for me? What am I doing? I was I was ticking all the boxes, I was working, I was networking, I was making my way in real estate. I just couldn't understand why I didn't feel like that and I didn't have that success and all these girlfriends around me were just absolutely killing it. Now I realise <laughs> that it doesn't always happen in your 20s, it doesn't happen in your 30s, it might not happen in your 40s and it might happen in your 60s. And I think you have to understand that there's a path for you and you just have to work and commit. And I've talked about this before about it's a stayer's game. You have to commit to it and you have to have the longevity. The success will come. It just doesn't happen in your 20s and but maybe it might happen in when you're 19. It might happen when you're 34 but for me it didn't happen until my 40s. So, yeah, it's a, it, everyone's journey is different, right, an individual. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I always say you've got to run your own race. Yes. But that advice is amazing um, to give to younger people because their perception of success and achievement is very different until reality sets in. Absolutely. I'm also very impatient. Uh, I, it's something I've suffered from for a very long time. I just, I, I always feel like when is the next thing? Like when's, you know, why can't I have that now? Or what do I need to do? That is getting a little bit less as I get old. <laughs> but in my 20s and my 30s, I just, I was so impatient. I just couldn't understand why it wasn't happening. So you just have to be patient. Yes, patience. Yeah, is, patience. Perseverance. Is a virtue. Patience. <laughs> yes. yes. It's terrible advice. Sorry. Sorry, everyone out there who wants it now, but you have to be patient. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So for people that are looking, and particularly females that are looking to become auctioneers, what would your top three tips be for uh, them? Just, just call me. Just call <laughs> me now. My number's on the screen. Just call me and I'll guide you through the process. You you have to you have to really stand up and say, this is what I want to do. Um, you have to train. You have to train endlessly. I remember Clarence saying something to me very early on when I joined the team. He said, Emma, you have to work twice as hard to become twice as good. And unfortunately in this space as women, we do have to be exceptional at this for us to really excel and shine. I'm sure that will change in the years to come, but I remember him saying that to me. And so what I did was I trained all the time. I trained really hard. I worked, I pushed myself. And then all of a sudden I've got these auctions coming in and I've got clients coming in. So I think you have to really work hard. Unfortunately, we have to work a little bit harder. That's okay. I don't mind that. I'm, I'm happy to do the work. And you have to back yourself and believe in yourself and, and you know, really and, – and you have to love the auction process and and want to help agents yeah. too. I mean that's a big part of our role is exactly. helping agents succeed and have exceptional auction transactions and have a great auction campaign and a great auction day. You know, you you have to you, – you, you, it's also, you know, being there for the agents and stepping up like that too. So I love that part of my role. And you do it so well. <laughs> it's pretty fun. So what you put in, you get out. Absolutely. 
that's something that I've always said to lots of people along my journey. So what I wanted to say once again is that you're an absolute inspiration. I feel that from a, a female to a female, I've learned so much from the short periods of time that we've had together and I feel that the listeners will take a lot out of today's conversation. But ending off, do you have a favourite quote? I do have a favourite quote and I love that you asked me this question. <laughs> it's actually not, um, it's not a famous person. Um, it's not somebody that you'd know. It's actually my husband and he, I was having a little difficult time with a few things, at, not so much at work but just when I started out in auctioneering and I was like, this isn't happening and what do I do about this and how do I get past that obstacle? And he just turned around to me and he just said to me, just keep doing what you're doing. And this might not always apply if what you're doing is not great, but <laughs> in my particular situation when he said that to me, I say that to myself all the time. This is really great for people who suffer from imposter syndrome. If you are feeling that you don't belong in a space and you're not sure where you're going, you have to stop and look back at what you've done. And obviously, if you just keep doing what you're doing, you've got to that point already. But when he said that to me, I, I it just, it kind of like slapped me in the face. You know, there's, there's no celebrity that says anything to me that impacts me. It's my husband that said, just keep doing what you're doing. I think that's and so great. Yeah. He kind of like pulled me aside and said it. And I was, and I thought to myself, well, I got to this point, I've got here with just doing what I'm doing anyway. So maybe if I just stick at it, and I keep pushing myself and I keep going along that path, again, a little bit of patience, sprinkle a little bit of patience <laughs> on the side of it. But definitely when he said that to me, it, it really impacted me. He's been a huge part of my success. I I mean, he taught me the value of, of having the backup plan, you know, from being an actress and jumping into real estate again. And, uh, you know, he's, I definitely contribute a lot of my success to, to having a husband who is just there and he is like my number one fan. So, yeah, when you said that to me, it kind of really touched me. Yeah. So it is good. about the people around you. 100%. You have to surround yourself with people that love you and think that you are amazing because then the sky's the limit. They'll just, they'll just help you rise to the absolute top. Exactly. Yeah. So for the listeners out there that want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yep, you can email me, you can call me. I love a chat, so I'm more than happy. I'm a real estate agent, so I always pick up my <laughs> phone, obviously. You can email me, you can call me, you can jump onto my Instagram as well, um, send me a note, jump onto LinkedIn, all the platforms I'm available. But if you do have any questions about auctioneering, and not only that, but if there's any agents out there that would like to talk about running better auction campaigns or anything. We're, as a team at Mink White, you should come and speak to us. We do it really well. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I just feel like I wanted to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can interview me <laughs> That's a great on, idea. on another podcast. That's a great idea. I would love that. Thank you okay. so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm very impressed with your team and I love everything that you do. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 